this is the first lecture in Astro 100, and we're going to talk about sizes and distances. Um, just some orientation about what's going on in the course. So this week we will cover uh, astronomy units for time, distance. We'll do a full survey of the cosmos so you guys know what you'll be learning this quarter. Um, the reading that that covers is Chapter 1 in The Essential Cosmic Perspective or Cosmic Perspective, any recent edition. And then on Saturday in the in-class session, um, you can start it at home, but we'll have a lot of time to work on Exercise 1 in class. So bring either a calculator or, you know, phone app, download a phone app that works as a graphing calculator. So at least a scientific calculator. You won't need it to be graphing yet. And then we will have our in-class quiz, and I guarantee the following question. Write a two-sentence description of an article that you read on the front page of Space.com News this week. So I want you guys to get plugged into uh, Space News as quickly as possible in the course of the quarter. Um, and the best preparation for the first quiz is to do the online practice quiz. Okay, so let's get started. Um, the goal of today's lecture is we will first become familiar with just all of the stuff that I will talk about in the cosmos. So we'll um, first be exposed to some names, globular clusters, and the organization of the structures within the universe. And then the nitty gritty is that we will introduce the units of distance that are going to be used in astronomy. So this is probably stuff that's been floating around in the back of your head, like parsecs and light years, but we'll talk about exactly what those are and when to use them. And then a very friendly introduction to scientific notation, and we'll get a little bit more technical about that in the first exercise. Um, the first thing to do is let's talk about what we're going to talk about. Uh, this slide you'll probably see, I don't know, somebody counted it once, maybe 24 times during the course of the quarter. And this will be our roadmap. So we're going to actually start on Earth and do what you would call classical astronomy, you know, learn what the ancients learn, and you guys can figure out how to make your own Stonehenge. And we'll move out to the planets and then out to the life of stars, how they eventually um, aggregate into cities of stars like the Milky Way galaxy, and then finally how things like galaxies interact with each other, and then finally cosmology, which would be, I guess, the background of this slide. So each one of these bright pixels, if you can see them, um, and you should definitely be able to on the PowerPoint capture, uh, represents an entire galaxy, so maybe 200 billion stars, and the universe is full of them. So uh, in a little bit more detail, We'll break it down week by week. So week one is really just taking a very, very broad survey of what we'll talk about in this course and organizing some um, meter sticks and some ways of telling time. So we'll formalize this uh, organizational scheme. It's something called the cosmic address is a great way of keeping track of it. And then we'll introduce our units of time, what, rel what time scales are relevant. The good news is, is basically human time scales are OK as long as you're fine with saying billions a lot. And then distances. So distances that we're used to on human scales don't work. So we need astronomical distances. We'll do all that this week. And then we'll move on to what you might call classical astronomy, uh, why we have seasons, what happens, and how do we classify eclipses, how to read sky charts, stuff like that. Um, if anybody asks, I'll explain what this funky figure eight thing is. Although it's not core uh, class material, I just think the picture's awesome. Then we'll move out to the solar system, and we'll try to do it in a very general way. So we will talk about our solar system, our planets, the asteroid belt, but we're going to try to generalize it as much as possible because as of you know, in the last 20 years, uh, astronomers have actually discovered over 3,000 planets around other stars, exoplanets. And now you, know, you guys, first generation in history, can really answer the question of um, how general is our solar system? Does everything look like a bunch of terrestrial planets close to a sun and gaseous planets farther out? Does everything have an asteroid belt? We're not quite ready to answer that yet. Or are we very unique? So actually, that answer um, is pretty much forthcoming now. So we'll try to talk about our solar system in a way that when we do get to exoplanets, it'll make a lot more sense. So next, we'll talk about the lives of the stars. Wrong slide. Um, and by the lives of the stars, we mean how they shine, why some are blue, some are large, some are red, uh, what their physical differences is, are, and what this thing is. So this will be the first introduction to really the periodic table of astronomy in some sense, like the core diagram of stellar astronomy, the so-called Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, and what these classifications mean, and then a little bit about exotic stars, variable stars. So these would all be um, so-called 
you know, maybe you would consider them to be healthy so-called main sequence stars. But then the sci-fi part of the course will start, and we will start talking about uh, star birth and star death. And this is where all the funky stuff, like black holes and supernovas, neutron stars, and planetary nebula come from. So this will be about week six of the course when we're finally ready to do that. And we'll get a little bit of, uh, you know, kind of a touchy-feely, fortunately math-free introduction to general relativity, which is required to talk about black holes. And then finally, at that point, uh, with a side excursion into exoplanets, you will have discussed every single so-called compact object or type of compact object that we know about in the cosmos. It's all the planets, all the stars, all the things that they uh, capture, like comets, and surround them, the dust clouds from which they come, and the dust clouds that they make when they blow up. So then we're ready to talk about how they interact with each other. So in a sense, you can think about it like we went to the zoo and we looked at all the animals in the cages, but now it's time to talk about the ecology of stars and planets and how they interact and live and die. And really what that is is a galaxy. So we'll talk about classification of galaxies much as we did in stars, and then really the closed loop that is uh, the star-gas star cycle, where stars are born from clouds of gas, and then when they die, they leave clouds of gas. And you can imagine you just let the, uh, let the gas cool down again, and you can make a new star, which is exactly what happens. So it turns out that our star is a third generation or second generation star. And more sci-fi, you cannot talk about galaxies without talking about dark matter. So we'll talk about the problem of dark matter and what people think it might be. And then after that, the galaxies themselves uh, interact and evolve in time. And the important thing to do, aside from look at a lot of really pretty pictures of interacting galaxies, is to start thinking about look-back time. So it turns out that when you look farther into the cosmos, you're looking farther back in time. And this will be our jumping off point to cosmology, which is more sci-fi. Um, so the argument of the expansion of the universe will go over the fact that it might be accelerating if we have a little bit of time. Uh, we'll talk about that and dark energy and this relationship in between particle physics and cosmology. So if you want to replicate the conditions a uh, billionth of a second after the Big Bang, you've got to build a giant 30-kilometer tunnel of a particle accelerator on the Swiss-French border to do it. And as well as the uh, classical Big Bang cosmology, we'll get a little bit into the modern stuff. So the cosmic microwave background radiation, and then so-called inflation and dark energy. And that will end the formal part of the course. But in parallel to that, what we'll talk about occasionally is um, why we do this. So what the human relationship to astronomy is. And back, you know, in 1000 BC or so, the idea of astronomy was really that the heavens provided mankind with a really good watch. So, um, you know, if you look at Stonehenge, it's actually a fantastic timekeeping device, which is an incredibly useful thing if you're either, um, you know, a pre-technological hunter-gatherer or farmer. And then at some point along the way, something else happened. So uh, astronomy became... Uh, really important question about where mankind, you know, lives in a philosophical sense. Are we at the center of the universe, or are we just another speck in a giant sea of the cosmos? Uh, could we communicate with those people? And then what sort of scientific questions can astronomy answer that could not be answered on Earth? So out there in the heavens, there is much more energetic processes than we could ever engineer. So it becomes a great laboratory. So I'll talk a little bit about that stuff as we go through, really why we do this. Okay, so this is the first time you'll see this, and at the end of every single one of the lectures or at breakpoints, I'll put these gray slides up here. And if you can um, understand the key terms and answer uh, or have maybe like a five-minute discussion with a classmate about the key ideas, um, you're in great shape for this course. So one of the wonderful things about astronomy is, you know, you guys ask questions a little bit harder in an online class, but definitely in person. Um, and I will try to answer them, and I'd love to talk about everything that interests you. But you also want to know what's on the quiz. So the gray slide is the answer to that. So this is the stuff that you'll be held accountable for. OK, so this would be a pretty good time to take a little bit of a break, and then we'll go um, pause, walk around, and we'll go on to the next set of material. OK, so first. Uh, Serious order of business is we need new units, and we need to talk about scientific notation. So this is the, uh, the serious ditch digging uh, that we have to get 
through mathematically before we really understand the cosmos. And hopefully at the end of this, you're going to start developing kind of an intuitive sense about how big is big and how far certain uh, objects are separated in, in space. And the thing that we're going to do is we're not going to make any problems for ourselves as scientists that we don't need to. So we're going to start with things that you're familiar with, um, human size scales, and then we're going to use them until we just give up and say, that thing is so far away that describing it with kilometers is just such a chore that we'll come up with something new. Okay, so these are, you know, this is a class taught in the U.S., but you know, us in Belize need to give it up, and we need to go metric. So we'll be entirely metric in this class. And these are the metric human-sized uh, units. So a centimeter is about the width of your finger. Uh, baseball is about seven and a half centimeters across. Uh, could change that into a better sport. So hockey puck is the same size. Humans, you know, adult humans go from maybe 1.4 to two meters tall, and your house or your apartment building might be like 10 meters or so across. So this should be something that makes sense to you, even if it takes you a little bit of thinking to convert. These are comfortable units. Where if I said, "Can you reach that? It's a meter away from you," you wouldn't uh, think twice about doing it. Not a problem. And then we can aggregate 1,000 meters into a kilometer. And then we're going to basically keep doing this trick, just multiplying by a power of 10, seeing how far that gets us, multiplying by a power of 10, seeing how far that gets us. And then we'll give up when there's something that's so far away that we just can't keep track of all the powers of 10. So first time we'll do that is we'll bundle 1,000 meters into a kilometer. And that would be you know maybe like 15 city blocks or so, I think it is. If I asked you to walk a kilometer for extra credit, most of you would probably say yes without thinking too hard about it. Not a problem. You understand what a kilometer is. You know, again, maybe a dozen city blocks. So there we are, we're at one kilometer. Okay. So before we do this, we'll take one aside just to um, let you know that we're not pulling any tricks, or at least we're not pulling any tricks that haven't been pulled before, and talk for a second about what a meter exactly is. So what is a meter in class? I would you know, have people maybe solicit suggestions, but now I'll just ask you to stop and think about it. And in fact, for a while, this was the meter. So this is now in a museum in Paris, but in, I think, 1789 or something like that, a bunch of guys with powdered wigs got together, and they put two scratches in this bar and said, that's the meter. So I want you to take a moment and just savor how completely arbitrary that is and why they did that. Well, the idea was that there's nothing special about it aside from the fact that if everybody can agree on a unit of measurement, it becomes useful. So there are no meters floating out in the cosmos. It's just a complete human construct that's useful. And we'll do this too. We'll actually do this a whole bunch of times during this course. When it's convenient, we'll measure things in Earth masses or solar masses or solar luminosities. We'll just define things that are convenient for us. And you can stop and take a guess about what this bottle is with a careful line etched in it and what this lump of, I think, uh, brass is in this little container. So this would be the the liter and the kilometer. So there are new measure, uh, there are new schemes for determining what those are now. Uh, and this is an old one, but just the point is it's totally arbitrary. We made it up and we all agree on it and that makes it useful. So we'll do that whenever we feel like we, uh, uh, we need a new unit of measurement and the old one is crappy. Okay, so next multiple of 10, and we're gonna write it in a really silly way. So we're gonna take our one kilometer, multiply it by 10 one time is what this means. So one kilometer times 10, one time is what the exponent means. So now we're at 10 kilometers, and now the features of the city itself, you know, this is Seattle. 10 kilometers basically gets you across Seattle at its narrowest point. You know, like it's, this would be downtown, and this would be South Seattle. And now, if I asked you to walk 10 kilometers for some extra credit, you might raise an eyebrow at me, and depending on how bad your grade is in this class, you might or might not do it. But you still understand what that means, is the point. And we're not close to astronomy yet. We basically have small features on one planet individually. OK. So another factor of 10. Now we've multiplied 1 by 10 twice, 1 times 10 times 10. So that gets us up to hundreds of kilometers. And now we start accessing some geology. So this is Washington State. It's about 560 kilometers across. And now you actually start seeing things like mountain ranges and major rivers. We're not at astronomy yet. 
I asked you to walk 100 kilometers for extra credit, you'd probably say no. If I asked you to drive 100 kilometers in your car for, um, oh, I don't know, like $10,000 or something like that, you'd probably say yes. You still understand what that means. So we still understand it. We can still use it. Aha. Our next factor of 10 gets us to astronomy. So 1 times 10 to the 3, or the order of thousands, so 1 times 10 times 10 times 10, is about the size of the moon, Earth's moon. So this is great. What this means is we don't have to come up with anything new. We can still describe uh, moons of planets. And our moon is actually a relatively big one in our solar system. So we can describe moons in terms of kilometers. We don't have to come up with anything new. Great. Another factor of 10, and we get uh, little terrestrial planets like Earth and Venus is about the same size. Mars and Mercury are smaller. So 1 times 10, 4 times, 1 times 10 times 10 times 10 times 10. And you basically have the diameter of Earth at about 12,000 or so kilometers. So great. Let's keep going. Another factor of 10, and we get to the largest planets in our solar system. So Jupiter is about 143 or so uh, thousand kilometers across. Roughly speaking, you can take 10 Earths and pile them across Jupiter. So maybe take a second, and if, you don't, uh, if you're not completely comfortable with scientific notation from you know, previous study or uh, you know, whatever middle school was for you, um, see if you can write the order of the size of Jupiter in scientific notation, like 1 times 10 to the what. You got 10 to the 5, you're in good shape. If this is still a little bit uh, befuddling, we'll go over it a little bit more. So that's fine. OK. So the moral is we've ripped off the rings of all the gas giants. Um, in fact, they all do have rings, not just Saturn. Kilometers are totally fine for this. So it looks like we're in really good shape. And in fact, kilometers will work for our sun, too. And it's a wonderful coincidence that it's about 10 Earths across Jupiter in diameter, and it's 10 Jupiters across the, uh, the sun, Earth's sun. So 1.4 million kilometers. And we're told, you know, we're, we're fine with millions. Maybe you've seen something online where people try to visualize how much a million is. But you don't freak out about it, right? And um, you could do a little bit of math, either on the back of a napkin or envelope or in your head, if you're really, uh, really sharp about that sort of stuff. And you could have some intuitive feeling about what these things mean. So if I wanted to take a jumbo jet across Earth, maybe it takes me about 12 hours. If I want to take a jumbo jet from one side of Jupiter to the other, it might take me like three weeks or so, traveling at 500 kilometers per hour or so. If I wanted to get from one side of the sun to the other side of the sun in a jumbo jet going at max speed, it might take almost half of a year. So the factor of 10. Um, and the idea of measuring things in kilometers still works, and you still have kind of an intuitive sense of uh, these sizes. So the sun, we would call that 1 times 10 to the 6 kilometers. You have six powers of 10 under our belt now. And kilometers are still great. OK, so this is where everything breaks. And in addition to just stating it, uh, this is the first time where we have to maybe break something that you've been conditioned to think for most of your life. Uh, anybody who's gone to the Air and Space Museum or the planetarium was encouraged to go into the gift shop. That's how they make you exit the place. You've got to walk through the gift shop. And there are posters that look like this. And I hate to say it, is they're all really, really, really misleadingly wrong. And this is going to be a thing that we'll confront all the time in astronomy because it's going to be really hard to represent both the sizes and the distances of astronomical systems accurately. So this, for one thing, they would never line up like this. This is terrible. But even though this is an accurate depiction of the sizes, so here's Earth. I can roughly fit about 10 Earths across Jupiter. And I can imagine that I could fit about 10 Jupiters across the sun. So the sizes are accurate, but the distances are incredibly shortened. So this is not anything that you would ever see. So terrible, terrible, terrible picture. And to fix that, um, we'll introduce the so-called grapefruit model. It's you know more formally, it's a one to ten billion scale, which means that I would take ten billion kilometers and shrink it to one kilometer. So, and we will get out to one kilometer with this. And the you know 
the non-mathematical version of it, which is much nicer, is you take the sun and you turn it into a grapefruit, and then you represent the rest of the planetary sizes and distances. So, um, I don't really like grapefruit, but I have this Nerf ball. So roughly speaking is, imagine that you've either blown yourself up or shrunk the sun to this size, and we'll put this right in the center of our model, and basically see how the rest of the planets stack up in both size and distance. And the nice thing about this, we'll refer to it constantly, even when we get to cosmology in this course, because it actually gives you a really good intuitive sense about how much emptiness there is in space. And for instance, when we collide with the Andromeda galaxy, all 400 billion stars uh, coming together, is that going to be an incredibly violent event or not? Okay, so there are also some ways of... Uh, and places where they've represented this in actual distances, where you can uh, take this kind of walking tour. I think the most famous one, there's one in uh, Colorado's, University of Colorado's campus. But there's also one pretty close to Capitol Hill in Washington, D.C., by the Air and Space Museum. And they put a grapefruit model out that people can actually walk. And it turns out that on a warm summer day, you really regret walking to Pluto. So if the sun were the size of a grapefruit, well, how big would... Let's just shrink down with the largest planets first. How big would Jupiter be? So what's something that's about a tenth the size of this? So maybe it's about the size of a marble or something like that. So take a marble, and that would represent the size of Jupiter. A little bit smaller, what would Neptune and Uranus be? Maybe that would be you know, the size of a pea or a pencil eraser. And then uh, when you get to the terrestrial planets, things start getting a little bit wacky. So Earth might be even just the size of maybe a... Uh, a flake of cracked pepper or a pinhead or something like that. So one-tenth, again, the size of Jupiter. And then Pluto, which is very small, would actually be nearly invisible to the human eye. So just take a second and think about those relative sizes. And now what we want to do is we're going to put them in correct uh, scale distance to each other. So maybe take a second and guess where we would put Earth. Okay. So in our scale model, we've got the sun is the size of a grapefruit or so, and we've got this pinhead of Earth. Where do you think that would be in the scale model? It's actually about 10 meters. So 10 meters, again, you know, about the length of this building. Now think about how much empty space that represents. So you've had, we have a grapefruit here, and then we have this pinhead that's about 10 meters away, and all of the empty space in between. So you can imagine how big this poster would be if they tried to get that right, so we kind of forgive them. So here are some of the... Uh, some of the relative distances and sizes, just to go really quickly through this, and you can study it at your leisure. Um, so Jupiter is about the size of a marble. It's 80 meters away, about the length of a football field. So imagine putting the grapefruit in one end zone and then taking this marble and putting it just about in the other end zone. And that's about, in scale, how far away Jupiter is. Uh, Saturn would be a you know, smaller marble, about a football field and a half away. Uranus would be about three football fields. And then Pluto, which is too small to see, is about six. So fairly incredible. And again, this is why you can't have a poster that represents both sizes and distances accurately. So this is where things get a little bit interesting, is Alpha Centauri, Proxima Centauri, very close to it, is the closest star to us. So you would imagine that that would be about the size of a tangerine, so a little bit smaller than this. Maybe we'll squish it or so. So Proxima Centauri. I would have to put Proxima Centauri in New York City if my sun grapefruit was in Seattle in this model. So it's incredibly far away, right? So when people talk about how hard it is to travel to another star, yeah, in fact, you should stop and consider how hard it was for us to travel to another planet um, very, very far away. So this will be... Um, Another place where we give up trying to measure things in terms of kilometers, but you can already see that measuring distances in between stars and planets, their planets and planets and planets within the same solar system is just going to be too much for kilometers, so we're going to give up on that. And secondly, just um, use the grapefruit model to internalize a little bit about how far away stars are from each other. So we're talking about two citrus fruits at the far ends of the United States. And when you know, the Andromeda galaxy, which is headed right for us, comes and collides with the Milky Way galaxy, it's actually not going to be a violent event. All we're really talking about is putting, you know, in this relative scale, two more citrus fruit in this empty expanse of, uh, of space. So collision isn't really the right word. It's all the stars in the two galaxies will gently flow together. 
Um, some violent stuff will happen, but we'll talk about that later in the course. So the utility of the grapefruit model, uh, as well as just being kind of cutesy, it actually does give you a good sense of relative sizes and distances. Okay, so I, you know, could try to do it, but I would fail, and I could try to represent the relative sizes, so sun and earth, and distances. So in distance, the sun and the earth on average are about 150 million kilometers away from each other, but it's really awkward, so we're going to stop. And the Earth is about one pixel, and the Sun is about three pixels across on the screen. So are they in proper relative scale? Tried as hard as I could. No, they're not. So if the Sun was four pixels across in this representation on the screen, the Earth would have to be you know, one fortieth of a pixel. So that's actually pretty difficult to do. So absolutely not. And this will be a generic problem. OK, so last time we'll really count up and um, multiply by 10, we get to the distance in between the Sun and Earth, and that's about 1 times 10, 8 times kilometers. And this is the point at which we give up. And we'll do exactly what the people back in 1789 did, is they got together and agreed upon something that everybody will use, and use that as a new quote-unquote meter stick to measure distances from that point farther, uh, that point onwards until that itself breaks. So the scheme that was developed was to call the average distance in between the Sun and the Earth, which is about 150 million kilometers, the astronomical unit, or one astronomical unit. So we're going to define this as basically like a meter stick, and we're going to use it, because you'll see in a second it's much more convenient than measuring things in kilometers. This is our first new unit, so the astronomical unit. And it turns out to be really useful for distances in between things in, um, within the same solar system, and actually a couple of the largest things in the galaxy. So the supermassive black holes and giant stars are actually about an AU across, if not more. Okay, so if you need a bit of a refresher on scientific notation or want to get a head start on the, um, the first exercise, I'll leave this link here. Um, but otherwise, we'll work on it a little bit on Saturday. So we have an AU, and now we're going to use it. So these are the distances from the sun to all of the planets in our solar system as measured in AU. And the thing to let wash over you is, you know, you don't have to memorize these. But just realize how convenient they are. So by definition, the distance from sun to Earth, is for Earth, is 1 AU. So much nicer than 149 million kilometers. The distance from the Sun to Mars is about 1.6 AU, from Sun to Venus is about 0.7 AU, from Sun to Mercury about 0.34 AU, Sun to Jupiter is about 5 AU, Saturn 10 AU. Very, very convenient, much more so than kilometers. Uranus 20 and then uh, Neptune 30. You'll notice there is no Pluto because this uh, graph was made after Pluto was kicked out of planethood, which we'll talk about in a couple of weeks. So you should also notice something about this uh, graph and the funny scale that's being used on it. So this is the first time we'll see it, but definitely not the last. So if you notice, there's something kind of weird going on here. And actually, if you notice there's a bit of a gap there that baffled astronomers for a really long time. Okay, so if I were to present that same sort of information, uh, Again, we've given up on representing the relative sizes of the planets, but let's just go for distance. So even that becomes hard. So we actually have a second problem, is that if I wanted to represent the orbits of all the planets, so here's, uh, here's Saturn, sorry, Saturn and Jupiter and Uranus and Neptune, and then all of the inner planets would fit within this quarter-sized patch, so we would have to even blow that up. So we get another problem with astronomy, is that it's really hard to represent um, all the information that we want on a single graph. And in fact, that's what people did here and tried to sneak it by you a little bit, is if you notice this funny scale, that's our first example of a so-called logarithmic graph. And you'll see it all the time. There's no way around it in astronomy. You won't have to make them necessarily, but you should learn how to read them or at least understand what's going on. And really what happened is exactly what we did is we zoomed out from close to far distances by multiplying by 10. Uh, astronomers have developed graphs that actually represent information in the same way. So believe it or not, these are two of the exact same graphs. So they have the same data. So this is a couple of uh, slides that indicate 
the number of bullet points on the slide and the number of people paying attention. And as you can see that if a slide has you know, nine or 12 bullet points, everybody stops paying attention. If it's only got two or one, I can still keep people's attention on it. But you'll notice something that even though these are the same numbers, so three and um, 3,000 and three and 3,000, on the vertical axis, they actually look really different. And this is what a logarith logarithmic graph is, is instead of doing what we do in a typical graph, which is from here to here, I add 10,000 from here to here, I add 10,000 from here to here, I add 10,000. Each one of these tick marks is adding the same number. What a logarithmic graph, so-called logarithmic graph, is, is what we did when we zoomed out of the cosmos, and we will continue to do, is we actually don't add, a, add the same number, we multiply by the same number. So here's one. And from 1 to 10, I multiply by 10. From 10 to 100, I multiply by 10. From 100 to 1,000, I multiply 10. So instead of adding the same number as I go up this column, I will multiply by the same number. And just the nature of you know, the universe is that the universe does not like small ranges of numbers. The universe uh, really values diversity, it seems like it. And you'll have stars that are thousands of times brighter than the sun, or 10,000 times or one-tenth of the brightness of the sun. It's never two or three, seldom. So you'll see a lot of logarithmic graphs. And you can even see the same data is that what looks like a beautiful straight line on this is almost impossible to interpret on this. So that's the value of using these. So seeing them once, you'll never see them. Uh, sorry, you'll see them basically every lecture. So so-called linear graphs versus logarithmic. OK. So we worked really hard. We defined the astronomical unit. And we're going to use it until it breaks. Basically, it breaks at the edge of the solar system. So to measure the distance to uh, Neptune or out to the Kuiper belt where Pluto lives, that's like 50, 100 AU. And then the second you get to the nearest star to us, that would actually require 50,000 AU. And there's a lot of emptiness in between. So we're going to use that meter stick only within our own solar system or within solar systems. But the second we talk about interstellar distances, we're actually going to come up with something new. So the nearest star is you know, 100,000 AU away, and people immediately find that that's kind of awkward. So we're going to actually define a new unit. And there are, actually, historically, there are two, uh, two units that get used, and they're almost interchangeable. You'll see them on the first exercise. They are the light year and the parsec being taught by somebody who's been trained as a physicist. So I'm going to use light years. Classical astronomers love parsecs. They also sound cool. They're kind of Star Trek-y. But um, we'll start by using parsecs. So what a, or sorry, light years. And what a light year is is exactly what it sounds like. What a wonderful name is. It is the distance that light travels in a year. So if I were to hit a laser pointer and point it out into space, and that pulse of light travels, after a year, it's made at about 9.6 times 10 to the 12 kilometers. So what an awkward number. But that is one light year. And you'll also see the magic of light years in a second. Is One of the things that's nice is that closest star, which you know, would be the tangerine in New York City in our grapefruit model, is about 4.3 light years away. One is that that's a really pleasant number to say. It's four light years away. And then if somebody asks you about the shoulder of Orion, you can say, oh, it's about 600 light years away. They're much nicer numbers, just like AU is a much nicer number to talk about distances within a solar system. The second thing that's really wonderful about light years is that they tell you something, is that when you're looking at Alpha Centauri, if you can find it, and you observe the light coming from it, that light is out of date. So it's actually light that left the surface of Alpha Centauri exactly because of the finite speed of light 4.3 years ago. So immediately when somebody describes distances in light years, they're actually also telling you how out of date that image is. So for instance, the sun is eight light minutes away from us. So when you look at the sun, you actually don't look at the sun. Um, when you, if one were to look at the sun, <laughs> you'd actually be seeing its surface as it appeared eight minutes ago. So light years has a really nice property as somebody says, you know, the Andromeda galaxy is 2.5 million light years away. And then you say, my goodness, when I look at it, that light took 2.5 million years to get to me. So that light came from before the human race was even a biologically viable thing. So light years is what we'll use for interstellar distances. 
and just writing it out once so you realize uh, that um, or appreciate what it does for you is one light year is about this many kilometers. So we've totally given up on kilometers at this point. So the good news is that we will use this for the rest of um, the distance scales, and we'll actually just talk about millions or billions of light years. Light years will get us to the edge of the cosmos. There's no point here, but uh, to, since we were in this crummy 2D picture, this is a 3D night light that represents our local uh, stellar neighborhood. So these are all the stars, and they've been put on fiber optic cables at the correct length. I just think it's cool, whatever. OK, so our next unit of organization, and if uh, I were to take that night light that I just showed you guys, it would probably all be contained within one pixel on this graph. So the galaxy in which we live, the Milky Way galaxy, has you know somewhere north of 200 billion stars in it, an incredible number of stars. And if we were to measure it, it turns out that light years are totally fine here. And from this edge to this edge of the disk of the Milky Way galaxy is about 100,000 light years. So what that means is light that's emitted by this star takes 100,000 years to get to the other edge. But it's also you know, a reasonable enough unit to use. So 100,000 light years. You could talk about a really bright star being 10,000 light years away from our, our solar system. OK, so next unit of organization. Um, our galaxy actually isn't just spinning out by itself in a lonely vortex. We actually have a neighborhood uh, group of galaxies called our local group. So in fact, we have two little things. If you've ever been to the southern hemisphere, maybe you've seen these, the Magellanic Clouds, uh, named after the first European to see them, I guess, as they tend to do. Um, so we have these two little orbiting galaxies. They're attracted by the gravity of the Milky Way galaxy. And they're um, you know, in the order of uh, 100,000 to a million light years away. Then we have another very large galaxy, as already stated. Um, it's coming right for us and will collide with us in about 3 billion years. So the Andromeda galaxy is in our local group. It's about 2.5 million light years away. It's a sensible number in the sense that you've heard millions so many times. And then there's the Triangulum galaxy, which is kind of getting in the middle. But all of these things are interacting with each other and tugging each other around. So this is our so-called local group. Our local group is actually part of a supercluster, uh, very uncreatively named the local supercluster. And the closest supercluster to us might be the Leo supercluster. I think it's actually the Virgo supercluster. And the point here, we'll get into all this stuff, is that light years are a fine description of these distances. So if you want to go from supercluster of galaxies to supercluster of galaxies, I put the uh, kilometers on here just to make you appreciate light years again. So I don't even know what this is, like how many groups of three that is. So. The uh, Virgo supercluster is, you know, uh, a billion light years away or so. That's totally fine. The point is we can just use light years for the rest of the course until we get to the largest structure there is in the universe. So this is the, sometimes you'll hear people get casual with this, and after this course is over, you should stop them. Um, so they say the universe is 13 billion light years across. Well, that's not necessarily true. The known or observable universe is uh, about 14 billion light years across. And billion is a term that people you know, use conversantly enough that we don't define any new units of measurement. We'll just keep using billions of light years. Occasionally, you'll hear people talk about megaparsecs, uh, but we'll get to that at the end of the course. So what this is representing is each one of these pixels is a group of galaxies now. And the universe has actually organized itself in this set of structures with these uh, big voids and these giant sheets of structure. And each one of these voids might be a billion light years across, which is to say that a star in a galaxy here emits some light. It would take a billion years to get uh, across that void. And these voids have absolutely nothing in them, you know, like one one atom per square meter or something like that, cubic meter. So fantastically empty. And again, the point is um, light years will still work. So that is both a tour of what we're going to do in this course. We're going to start on Earth and then slowly work our way out to larger and larger structures. And it's an introduction of what those structures are. And then most importantly is how we're going to measure distances and um, 
when to use each size of, uh, when to use kilometers AU or light year to describe which structures. So if you can do that and you can remember some of the terminology here, you're in great shape. Okay. Okay, so as a last way of organizing this, we talked uh, a little bit about these things, and you're probably bombarded with jargon. So, you know, clusters of galaxies and superclusters and light years and parsecs and local stellar neighborhood and stuff like that, and astronomical units. Um, there's a nice way of organizing this that your textbook came up with. I think it's actually the, those authors that first publicized this. Is There's a scheme to organize... Uh, the levels of organization of structures in the cosmos into so-called cosmic address. And the idea is this works really well on Earth. So if you want to send somebody a postcard, you actually do something that maybe you haven't thought about too much before, is you start small and then you work bigger and bigger and bigger, so to less and less specificity. So you can, you know, get this postcard to where it needs to go by going to the right country and then the right city and then the right zip code and then the right street and the right address and then the correct occupant and you're narrowing down. Or if you read it the other way, you're going to more and more general and bigger and bigger structures. So really, truly, you're going from you know, meter to 10 meters to kilometers to tens of kilometers to thousands of kilometers. And the idea of the cosmic address is just keep doing that and use space-relevant or astronomy-relevant uh, organizational structures, and it helps you keep all of the sizes and scales and terminology in the correct order. So let's say that I have a, uh, a cosmological mailman or mailwoman who lives in the multiverse, so we have to even tell her which universe we live in, and she wants to deliver a postcard to me. So first she's got to get the correct universe, we call it the universe, then she's got to get the correct supercluster of galaxies. So we don't live in the supercluster, uh, the Virgo supercluster, the Leo supercluster. We live in the local supercluster. So then she goes there. Within that supercluster, she's got to find the right cluster of galaxies. We live in the local group, us and Andromeda and Triangulum and um, the Magellanic Clouds. Well, then after she's found the local group, she's got to find the right galaxy. So she finds the Milky Way galaxy. Within those 200 billion stars, she's got to find the right one. So she goes to our solar system. Again, sort of uncreatively, we've named that the solar system. Sometimes people refer to it as Sol. Uh, I think that caught on in the sci-fi literature. So once she's found the solar system, well, which planet, Earth, what part of Earth, and then the regular address takes over. So this is a couple of things. One, it's a roadmap for the course. So this is what we'll be doing all, um, you know, starting here and going there. That's what we'll be doing for the next 10 weeks. But secondly, it's a nice way of helping you kind of zoom in and out and remember the relative sizes and distances of these things. So if you really got the gist of the last um, set of material that we talked about, in metric, using astronomy-appropriate um, distances, if you could write by the side of these or on a piece of paper what the correct size or unit to use is, you're in great shape. Should I be using meters, kilometers? Um, astronomical units, megaparsecs, light years, furlongs, just throw some, uh, some distractors in there too. So if you can do that, you're in great shape. Maybe take a second, pause the video, and do that. So here we are. We'll, we'll even do the boring earthly stuff. So uh, humans and houses... We'll call those meters. Now we get to a city. Kilometers is appropriate. And then basically we're kilometers all the way until we get to sizes in the solar system. So kilometers for regions of a planet, kilometers for planets themselves. But then when you start describing distances in between planets, we've got to give up on, you know, we chose to give up on kilometers, and now we use AU. AU has a pretty limited application. So you use astronomical units for, there are a couple of, um, there are a couple of exceptions to the rule, but basically you only use astronomical units for distances in between solar objects in a solar system or the size of a solar system itself. So once we start talking about distances in between stars or collections of stars, then we're light years and light years all the way down. So our group of galaxies that are interacting light years, our supercluster of interacting groups of galaxies, light years, and the observable universe itself, light years are totally fine. So if you got that, also great shape. 
And then finally, the key terms, these are the things that you should um, understand what they mean. And the key ideas of the lecture are these, if you could you know, get caught in an elevator and discuss them with somebody for five minutes and you know, sound very knowledgeable, you're in really good shape. And the practice quiz online will cover all of, the, uh, all of this stuff as well.